All right, Excellent. Mark, you're on. Thanks. All right. Uh, thank you again, everybody. I appreciate your time this morning, uh, getting up early to um, allow me to present. Uh, so the name of our, our the presentation today is uh, Uncovering the Defending Revenue Risk. Uh, Pragmetrics Group is really uh, a divine intervention that um, really I had nothing to do with just recently. I've been in the clothing business forever, and I partnered with my current business partner here on the clothing business in, uh, in January. Uh, had great January, had a great February, had a going into a great March, and then COVID hit. Uh, the clothing business, as you know, has been decimated with uh, the bankruptcy of, of uh, Brooks Brothers now, but they just got bought by private equity, you know, Neiman's filing, Brooks, I mean, uh, J. Crew. I've had, I, I had this pragmetrics and uh, we started exploring it and, and Raj and a couple other guys said, hey, listen, we want to invest in this and we want to spin this back up. We think it's a great concept. And so we've done that. So really COVID for us or COVID for me has, uh, has really been a little fortuitous because it has, has allowed us this time to redevelop and redesign and reorganize this particular company. So it was Pragmetrics. We now call it Pragmetrics Group. Uh, the meaning of Pragmetrics, when we originally founded the company, was pragmatic metrics, that we weren't necessarily consultants you know, with this blue ocean strategy, but we actually wanted to give you pragmatic metrics that you can use uh, and drive down into your organization and your front lines. So this is the perception gap. And this is true, um, has been true for every engagement that we've done. And uh, from the CEOs I've talked to, a lot of the old clients that I have contacted, letting them know that we're re-spinning up Pragmetrics, uh, this is still true. Uh, and I'll, I'll give you an email at the end of the presentation that will, um, that will speak to this. But perception gap, 80% uh, of CEOs think their firms offer a superior customer experience, but only 8% of their customers agree. And that's, so we, so we help people close that gap. So satisfaction versus loyalty. Um, and I love the quote by Jeffrey Gittimer. He says, customer satisfaction is worthless. Customer loyalty is priceless. Um, you're only going to hear from 4% of your dissatisfied customers. Uh, 96 just don't voice complaints, and then 90, 91% just never come back. So um, satisfaction is really what we have found, I guess, on the 30-plus engagements that we've done. Satisfaction is just too low of a bar. And really the difference between satisfaction and loyalty, loyalty is all about emotion, right? How do people really feel about your company? How do they feel after every engagement, whether it's an email, phone call, or a face-to-face -face, uh, interaction? All right, Jim. And anytime anybody has questions, please feel free to jump in. This is very informal and really want your feedback. So how Pragmetrics was started, uh, one of our partners was actually blindsided by the loss of his biggest account. Uh, he literally took the guy to lunch. I was having lunch with him. He said, everything's going great, Mike. Uh, things are great. Uh, he leaves the lunch. He's driving back down 285 gets a call from his service manager, Hal. He said, hey, do you know that our competitor is doing lunch for Volvo Rents? He said, you've got to be kidding me. I just had lunch with the guy. He said, everything's great. Uh, and he said, how did you hear that? He said, I didn't hear it. I'm watching it. So the competitor was actually doing work on the property while Mike was having lunch with the general manager. And uh, he was just absolutely gut punched. He was completely blindsided. So right now, uh, post-pandemic, you know, people... A lot of the CEOs I've talked to in the last 30 days really have no idea what their customers are thinking. Uh, they want to pivot, but it takes a lot of time and resources to pivot, and they really need to know, what's, you know what their customers are thinking before they do that. So the question is, is there a way to uncover revenue risk and growth opportunities? Um, people have called us a variety of things. They've called us a bartender. I've been fortunate. We have now people in place that will be doing the interviews. I'll be coaching them. But I've been fortunate to do almost 3,000 interviews, uh, interviewing people all the way from the CEO of Safeco Insurance, um, Duke Power, um, all the way down to $10 an hour employees, to military personnel jumping out of airplanes and talking to these people. And it's just, a, you know, some people, they call us a bartender, the fly on the wall, pillow talk, priest in the confessional, whatever you want to find out, we can find out for you and it, it find out exactly what your customers are thinking. So this is really, unfortunately, where a lot of CEOs live. 
Um, when we get in a room, a, a lot of our business comes from lunch and learns, uh, executive lunch and learns. Most CEOs, not only are they not getting the truth from their customers, they're not even getting the truth from their executive team. And they know it. We don't have to say it. Um, they're not, especially their VP of sales. No one wants to give the boss bad news, right? And all of a sudden they're blindsided and uh, then, you know, the crap hits the fan. And so we basically mitigate that and, um, and help CEOs from being blindsided by customer defections. It starts with the truth, you know, getting the truth from your customers. So we have a, a, a four-step process that our Cadence Insights delivers actionable feedback on almost real time. And we start with obviously a benchmark and getting, finding out where you are, getting the truth, uh, get that feedback. Uh, we have a 95% response rate versus uh, surveys that have very anemic, low double digit or low single digit uh, response rates. We provide recommend, we, the recommendations we provide come directly from your customer. They don't come from us. Um, and then we have an ongoing process, our Cadence Insights process that uh, helps you retain those clients, your clients throughout the year. Uh, we touch them constantly for you uh, behind the scenes and uh, make sure that they, not, they, don't, uh, they don't leave you. Again, going back, we don't use impersonal or ineffective surveys. Um, you know, surveys, we're, we've been surveyed to death. And I've talked to a lot of people that had that use surveys all the way from uh, SAP to a lot of our clients. Uh, every engagement we've had that we've won has been against a Qualtrics or somebody that was thinking about using a survey, SurveyMonkey, uh, Customer Gauge, you name it. Uh, they were thinking about using it until we came in. You know, people are disingenuous on surveys. They'll put whatever just to get through the survey. Uh, so they're, they're really end up being black marks on paper. And they're, they're a lot of times they're just not actionable. So we start with benchmarking our benchmark report. We come in, we actually benchmark or baseline your organization and find out exactly where all your customers are. And then once we do that, that's really gives us our starting point. So then once we, have, once we do that, we segment um, your clients into different sectors, right? We, call, um, we use NPS only uh, as a tool. We're not an NPS organization, but because the science behind the numbers has been vetted so well, uh, we use that as a tool to segment your clients into uh, detractors, passives, and promoters. So you can see your revenue risk. A lot of people, you know, and what's, what's great that I've done so many phone calls and now that I'm coaching people that make the calls for us is that a lot of guys think, well, if I get a seven or even an eight, uh, you know, that's not a bad score. Well, if you look at the numbers, sevens and eights are passives. Um, so zero to six is detractors. They're not saying good things about you and they're going to leave or they're getting ready to leave unless they're, or they're trapped in a bad relationship, like a bad banking relationship, or maybe sometimes it's too painful to change. We've done work for companies that they, they wanted to leave, but this company was the only game in town, kind of like a like a Comcast or an AT&T, they want to leave, they're, they're just trapped in a bad marriage. Uh, you know, sevens and eights, they're, they're smoke in the wood pile. If I call somebody up and, I, and the guy says, hey, on a scale of zero to 10, how likely would you be to recommend ITB partners to a friend or a colleague? And they give me an eight, I know I've got to do some digging, right? Um, and you know, of course your nines and tens are promoters. Uh, so sevens and eights, if something better comes along, they're like they're really likely to jump ship. Promoters, only if you're getting nines and tens, they're going to exhibit three behaviors. The first, they're going to continue to do business with you. They're going to buy other products and services that you sell. And most importantly, they're going to give you unsolicited word of mouth referrals. So those are loyal and everybody else is satisfied. So once they're segmented, you really begin to see, this is the biggest slide that our CEOs will absolutely love. They, it's shocking actually when they see, um, I, can, I can tell you at every engagement that we've done, that 80, that 80%, that 88% is so true because when they see the slide, they're absolutely flabbergasted um, what their customers have actually told us and how much revenue is potentially at risk. So in a $10 million company, you got 4.6 million potentially at risk because you've got passives there, but you've got 1.2 or a little over 10% of your revenue that's definitely at risk. 
and you need to do something about that. So when we say we provide actionable feedback, this is right from your customers. These are, um, we also uncover future products and service offerings. We, we, so for example, if, if I'm on the call and, and someone says nine or a 10, right? Which is a great score. I'll say, great, that's fantastic. So let me ask you, I ask what's called the magic wand question. If you could take a magic wand, Stephen or Doug, and, and ask for anything, right? The, to, go, to, get, to get to an 11 or a 12, to really um, delight you, what would it be? And these are some of the things that they'll say, well, if they could do this, if they could do that. You know, one company that we did work for was a high, uh, they did pneumatic hose repair. So they would do 24 seven hydraulic hose repair. They would go out, fix the hose and uh, get, the, get the yellow iron back up and running so they weren't losing money. So when we called for their company and, he, and they were doing a great job, they, were, they had a net promoter score in the 70s. So they were really doing a great job, a lot of nines and tens. So I just started asking, what could you do to get to an 11 or a 12? And out of the 40 people that I asked, 22% said, well, if they were, while they're fixing the hose, if they could change the air filter, the oil filter and the gas filter while they're in there, that would save us a lot of downtime from taking our equipment out of the field. That feedback came back. All of a sudden now he carries filters on his truck. He's increased his business by 22%. Not only that, but he's built a moat around his business and kept his competitors out because they're not doing that. So those are the things we uncover as well. New business opportunities, new product offering. Uh, so this is our, our process. Uh, and Steven and all your consultants out there are familiar with your feedback loop, inner loop, outer loop, uh, your huddle group, problem solving internally. So we have a proprietary process. Uh, we onboard the clients. Uh, we talk to your clients through you, for you. And we always maintain integrity and trust between you and your clients and always protect your company's information. So these are unedited verbatims uh, from a client that we did work for. Uh, they happen to be in the packaging business, right? And this is stuff you're not gonna get in a survey, right? You're, you're, not, gonna, these, you're not gonna get actual verbatims uh, of what your promoters like about you. You know, they're among the top three or four in our industry we do business with them. As far as quality and service, great products, ease of doing business, I can't think of anything that anybody, anybody does any better. This is from your promoters and, um, so we, we basically segment them out. So these are passives, right? And look what your passives are saying. You know, sometimes they're not as competitive as, they, as we need them to be. So they're smoking the wood pile. You know, there are times a challenge to deal with operationally. That's a passive, that's a seven or an eight, right? Uh, they've rewarded our loyalty by making it more difficult to do business with, to buy those other products. Those are, that's smoke in the wood pile. There's something that, you know what, if that doesn't change, they're gonna be looking for another supplier. So it's interesting what the passives, you know, say. And we know when you hear on the phone and I'm listening, we're listening. So we actually start digging deeper. Well, what do you mean by that? You know, and all we do is ask questions. We don't, we don't promote, we don't defend. Our average call goes 12 minutes. That's an average call. And you get a lot of information in 12 minutes and I'm only asking questions. Your customer's doing all the talking. Uh, obviously these are um, uh, detractors. Sorry, I got a typo in the spelling. These are all the dislikes, right? Um, things that they don't like about you. You know, people, they, like the last comment, I hate, you never want to hear that, right? I hate when it's all of a sudden my responsibility to figure out how to get the product, sh they shorted me, right? Um, they become very structured in how they ship. Shipping was a big issue. They've resolved it now, right? They've resolved all these issues since then, but shipping and, and uh, was a big issue for them and shorts, uh, shorting their, uh, their customers. So these are just, uh, a couple of um, testimonies from com companies we've done business with. So we are an unbiased third party. We do not promote or defend. Uh, Barkawi Management, they're a supply chain management uh, consulting firm, about a $50 million company. They were just purchased by Gempac, a managed services company. They're about 500 million. And they just said, you know, we were able to get valuable insights that they could not get internally from their own customer experience team. Most people do have an internal team. But what we've heard, what I've heard on the phone is that customers still think, even if you call internally, there's still an agenda, right? There's still an agenda and they're not going to be completely honest and truthful with someone even calling internally. So they said leveraging an unbiased third party was transformational. Uh, the depth and nuance from the information enables to get better customer loyalty and cover new revenue opportunities for them. 
uh, we, we actually, we found several new revenue opportunities for them where they could help in other areas. So this is Robert Ballantyne. He's a very well-known uh, financial services company in Atlanta. They have about $5 billion under, under management. Uh, they brought us in uh, because they, the year before, they spent $20,000 on a 40-question survey that got a 7% um, response rate from their clients. So uh, we came in. And we, again, talked to their top 20% of their clients. I mean, some of these people had 50, 60, $70 million invested with Robert. And what's amazing is when I talk to these people, they're like, well, we just really appreciate Robert, you know, managing what little money we have. Because they always think someone else has more money than them, right? It really blows me away. But uh, we actually, for this, where he said it's great that she shared feedback, she was unwilling to tell me directly, this was a $10 million account that was about to leave. And he had no idea. So we actually saved him, saved him this $10 million endowment fund that was about to defect. And obviously that paid for our engagement, you know, 10 times. So this was actually uh, a private equity company that brought us in uh, when they brought their new CEO in. So they wanted to baseline their company before the CEO talked to the employees and the management team. So they came in, we talked, their, we, we baselined the company, then he went to the employees to find out if their story matched what their customer said. And uh, it was very transformational. You know, Steve just said, you know, that he loved everything and uh, they were just extremely uh, pleased with us. And they've actually uh, come back and retained us a second time. And then now he's, Steve's no longer with this company. He went to another company called uh, Flight, which does all the black box technology for secondary airlines, not the top tier, but the second tier. He called us, he retained us again for that company. Now we moved again to another company and he's going to bring us into, he's a CEO of another company. So this really, uh, just, we just found this uh, last week, it was an article that just came out by Inc. Magazine. The five must do steps to win after the pandemic. And solving the, your, uh, the customers, uh, the problems your customers will face before your competitors do. Number three on that five was assessing your company's strengths and weaknesses and uh, highlighting to reach unbiased conclusions, hire an independent analyst who will gather evidence to answer the questions below. And that's exactly what we do. So we are really using this um, article, uh, we're leveraging this with our clients. So it's, uh, it's been a little bit of a feather in our cap. So we're trying to get as much mileage out of this as we possibly can. So why us, right? Um, we do not promote or defend. We're, we're agnostic. We're, we're third party. We have a 95% response rate. Uh, we give you verbatim feedback. We highlight potential threats and opportunities. We validate your survey data. So if you're doing surveys or doing anything like, we come in and validate that. And nine times out of 10, it's not accurate right? Because people, they just lie. They don't tell you the truth on surveys just to get through them. Uh, we do not disrupt your current customer relationships. Uh, there's actually, a, there's so much trust in what we do. Uh, you know, we have NDAs, we do what we cross all the T's, dot all the I's, guys, and then we uh, uncover future products and service offerings. Our management team, Raj Calver, he's the managing partner. Uh, Raj is a serial entrepreneur. He's actually the one that decided to take to respin this company back up. He saw the potential, especially in private equity. Um, and he owns several different companies. He has a restaurant supply company. He has an office supply company, um, financial services company. He just purchased a uh, chiropractic franchise called New Spine that was a spinoff of the joint after they went public. The owner, uh, their two-year two, two non-compete uh, was coming up. So now it's version 2.0. Just purchased that for Georgia. Um, and he's been the impetus behind our, behind uh, Pragmetrics Group. So we don't need any money. We have plenty of money. Me, yours truly, I do all the sales uh, and key accounts. So Mike McCarthy is the operations. He was uh, 22 years with GE. Uh, the last 12 years on a direct Tiger team with Jack Welsh. Uh, going into underperforming companies, uh, turning them around and selling them. So Mike's our operations guy, and uh, he really does a fan fantastic job doing a lot of our reports. And um, so what, one thing I've learned during this is that sell sales does not control the customer experience. It's all operations. So thank you for your time. Uh, Jim, I do want to share, I do, before questions, but I do want to share my screen and show you one thing just to 
kind of validate what we uh, the CEOs I've been talking to. So this is a, a Kids 2, a company that we did work for, right? And this is the CEO, Ryan uh, Gunnigal. They're going to re-engage us again because now we're re-spinning it up. He said, good suggestion, probably worth the cost to get real-time feedback, especially during COVID. We might not know all of our customers' pain points like we think we do. Talked to three CEOs. Ryan's one of them. The other one uh, was Paysetter Steel that we did work for. Uh, the other one, and... and um, She's, Aviva uh, said the same thing. She was, Mark, we have no idea what our customers are thinking during the pandemic and post-pandemic. We want you guys to come back in and find out what's going on. You know, that's real feedback from a real CEO of a $500 million organization. And uh, so I will open it up for questions. Yeah, Mark, thanks for the detailed explanation. Can you give us a range, because I don't think I asked this question, we talked a couple of weeks ago, a range of what your what a proposal might cost the company? Like, is there different levels or how you go yeah, about that? You know, every, you know, it's, it, it's every engagement is, is different, right? It, it, how many, how many customers are we talking to? Uh, not only how many customers, but how many touch points within that customer, right? So typically we like to, to talk to as many people inside one customer as possible, 50,000 foot, 30,000 foot, 10,000 foot level. So we really get a breadth of feedback from not from the, the VP or a CEO all the way down to somebody on the front lines. So every engagement, every engagement is different. I can tell you that we're not an Accenture, you know, those guys don't even answer the phone less for less than $250,000, but every one of them, and Stephen can probably attest to this, everyone that I've talked to, because I make clothes for a lot of those guys, um, they said, Mark, we do exactly this. Before every engagement, we do exactly what you're doing. We just charge a quarter of a million dollars to do it. Right, so we're way below that, but every every um, every engagement is different, depending on how many touch points that we talk that we talk to. And hey Mark, I've got uh, two things for you. The the first is is that if you've got any um, public relations material or any uh, marketing material that uh, you would like ITB partners to uh, uh, distribute through our network. You know, that's what we're here for, to get as much exposure as possible. So uh, right. uh, get back to me on that, and I'll be happy to help you out. The other uh, question is, I assume that your clients don't have some kind of an internal mechanism to uh, do this service for themselves. Um, is that something that um, you can help set up within an organization, or, or do you not do that? Yeah, you know, uh, I just talked to, you know, it's interesting, we're talking to SAP right now. Uh, it's a guy in our Bible study that um, he was with SAP for for five years. And um, I can't remember, remember the term he used. You guys probably know it. Um, uh, he, um, he said, you know, it's better to hire than to create, right, um, our own. It's, it's, more, it's, it's better to hire you, to bring you guys in. And he actually... He actually uncovered a uh, he uncovered a, an opportunity within SAP and Oracle and some of these bigger companies that we didn't even think about. But yeah, you know, not necessarily a lot of you know again, uh, some a lot of companies do that we've talked to do have internal customer experience teams, but they're again they're using surveys. You know, they're they're not actually talking to their customers, having conversations with them, right, and getting that getting that verbatim feedback you know, and drilling down and, and having seasoned professionals on the phone, uh, asking them, you know, questions, drilling down and drilling down. Um, so the, again, the feedback that we've, that we've gotten. So to answer your question, no, we don't set up customer experience internally, uh, but we do validate and support uh, the data that they, that those surveys are they, that they produce. Great. Thanks, Mark. Mark, that was a good presentation. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, two thoughts when you and I had spoken this past fall that have come to me since our discussions. First of all, I've been getting calls from people who are going through, they're, they're letting their people move outside of strict procedure and it's causing a problem. They're trying to decide if they need to build a procedure or let their customers roll and let these you know complaining customers go. So what I'm finding is, is the industry is still changing enough where the marketplace isn't settled. Where I've told these people, you know, you, you've got to write that procedure or let these complaining customers go. So I think when you talk to your people 
and you talk to your customers, you're still faced with the problem of is the industry they're in going to be around in five months? Is the segment they're going to be in going to be around in 90 days? Were the customers just being unrealistic? That's my point I'm bringing to you. And, um, and how you could qualify that in your, in your work. The second point is I think the handoff is, is still, still something we need to consider. We can't look to the NFL right now, the NBA, about how to pass a ball around. But your work, you know, feeds into my work. And then my work feeds into like a Daryl Jackson. You know, I do the work. Oh, we need a problem. We need to go call Daryl or Dave Daniels. You know, they're specialists after we've nailed down how to get out of the mess they're in after you've identified, you know, why they're in the mess that they know that they're in. So I think the handoff, if we could smooth that out, that we could uh, probably bring more value to your customers and, you know, we could all make more money in the process. Yeah, we pay uh, very healthy referral fees. So we, and that's another area, like I was talk, talking to Stephen, that we're really looking to grow is through our alliance uh, program where we bring in other people that want to take this methodology into their customers, either white labeling it or bringing us in, you know, however, whatever makes more sense. And Yeah, I've got another question and I, I forgot this. Do you also talk to customers of like B2C companies? And I, and yeah, I asked that because what if, how do you, well, well, do you do B two C companies like um, you know restaurant hospitality stuff like that to get? Yeah, to we're we're strictly yeah we're strictly B two B. You know B two C. We 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 tried it a couple times. It's very overwhelming. Um, <laughs> you know we you know we, at some point we may you know Raj was saying hey you know once we start getting traction we may want to we may want to look at it but right now there's there's so much business out there in the B two B space. Um, that you know, it's just not something we're going to focus on right now. And our typical company that we're looking for is, you know, really north of 50 million. Um, you know, the real sweet spot is, you know, 100 million and up. Um, but you know, we've done work for, you know, 10 million dollar companies. But um, um, you know, so 50 million north of 50 million, we are are you know good uh, a good sweet spot for us. You know, we had one company too that we did in Augusta, a 150-year-old steel company that did bid work and contract work. Uh, we're on the bid work when they did they were they did steel erection and steel fabrication. They had they had five buyers in there. They had a project manager, a vice president, uh, an architect, an engineer, and one other person. And for, after all these years, they had no idea who actually made the final decision. And they wanted us to talk to find out who actually made the final decision. And when we went in, after talking to all the VPs and everybody, um, it was the project manager. All the VPs and the president said, I will never override my project manager. And so now they knew who to wine and dine and take out. And, and with kids, too, with Ryan that you're seeing on the screen, they engaged us to find out if they should buy a company or not. And uh, we said, yeah, you should. They ended up buying the company. And it's a huge profit uh, area of profit for them. It's, and they wanted us to call all their customers and all their buyers to find out if they thought it was a good idea. That's interesting. So uh, people doing due diligence on acquisitions then would yeah. be a uh, Yeah, that's, that's really where Raj, you know, he's a private equity guy. He's been in finance for a long time. He re That's where he really sees the value is in private equity, buying companies, selling companies, increasing the value. And because if you've got, if you've got a, if you've got a solid customer base, and you know your customers and you've got a high net from and your customers are going to stay loyal with you, dude, that adds value to the sale of your company. Well, you know, my uh, perspective has always been that, that um, you know, most, first of all, most acquisitions don't actually work. And um, I think a large part of it is because the uh, poor due diligence that goes into the uh, acquisition too often, it's just strictly a numbers uh, game right. based on the financials and doesn't look at it from a, a broader perspective, um, you know, from a from customer uh, experience standpoint, as well as operations execution and you name it. You know, I think that's a huge opportunity for you. Yeah, so with Mission Mobility, you know, they were gonna sell that company, they ended up keeping it. Mm -hmm. Private equity, they, they said, you know what? After we got, after they were just in it to win it and get rid of it and bring Steve New, Steve in, CEO turned around, sell it. We came back with the report. They said, you know what? I think we're going to keep this company and run it. Um, how about how about internal customers? You know, from a um, um, 
you know, climate surveys and things like that. Yeah, uh, Barkawi, um, the management consulting firm that we did, they have internal customers, right? So uh, we did some, we we did a few, not many, uh, for them. But but what was interesting for them, um, they they had a flagship customer that they thought for sure. When I you know I asked them before I called this customer, I said, "What do you think?" You know, so the CEO was in front of me, the VP of Sales, and the CEO. <laughs> The COO was in front of me and I said, what kind of, just give me an idea before I call these guys, what kind of score do you think they're going to give you? And all, I mean, within an, a nanosecond, they all said 10, right? I mean, this is a, probably a 20% of their revenue. I called a guy and they, he, they got a seven. You know, it was it really just rocked the whole company. So, um, they had to do some damage control. The CEO had to get involved. He had to go back in, you know, restore the relationship. And um, the only saving grace was the work that they were doing was so good. Um, but there were some other operational issues that they had. Uh, they had kind of taken their hands off the steering wheel a little bit. And um, um, so. Hey, Mark, a couple of, couple of just points. That great presentation. Wow. That I like the way that you sort of bypass the survey industry and uh, get to the point. But one of the things that you present, just to build on what Stephen was saying, is what do they do with the data, right? Um, my experience is with the reason that most acquisitions fail and the reason that most change initiatives fail is for three reasons. They, they're not taking the data like you have and figuring out, to your point, where all the touch points are on operations. And as a result, there's a there's a difficulty in them making the transition to close the gap that you give them. And it, it, it boils down to just several things that are pretty fundamental, that are hard to change. And a lot of it comes around culture and business processes and operational touch points and, and redesigning the organization from that outside in perspective. And just as an aside, that's that's sort of some of the things that I do. So as those those type of things come up. Uh, you know, just I, I think it'd be great because well, I think one of the things we can do at ITB Partners is continue to improve the valuation of our companies, right? With all the different, with all the different skill sets that we have, and right. just getting the right person in there, so that we're partnering as a group uh, to help the company with our specific um, strategic skill sets that we have. So just a thought, um, yeah. but I um, mean, what Stephen put up on the chat. I've seen so many different times and that, that 74% failure rate usually comes around those three major focal points that most good executives don't see. And you, you let them know that because of that little two path chart that you, you show, you know, <laughs> they're getting all those lies of what is really great going on. Yeah. And then the poor CEO walking down the other street with the real truth. Yeah, and that, those real truths usually point to those three things. In my experience that I've seen, um, that's why they're, they're unsuccessful. Yeah, so, so we that's where we come in and help with our Cadence Insights process, where it's usually a, a, a two or three year engagement that once we benchmark the clients, then uh, we will come in and help either, um, they, they, they've got a good handle on the nines and tens, so we come in and manage the one through eights for them, right? And we continue to touch them throughout the year, we, con we continue to touch them um, in real time to see if they're, if they're we, we kind of hold the company accountable for them to see if they are overcoming a lot of those issues. So that's what our Cadence Insights process uh, does. And uh, so we're constantly touching them. You know, we constantly touch the customers for them. And uh, so we really kind of hold them accountable to make sure that they're getting these changes implemented that, uh, because the CEO basically sends out a letter after our engagement, say this is what we heard. Uh, these are the top three. These are the top three issues that we've heard. These are the things that we we're going to address, and um, then th then we, that's where we kind of hold them accountable. Now and then we'll we don't do any of the implementation. Uh, we would bring in somebody like you or Stephen. Um, we don't recommend. So we we tried that, and it was really. It didn't work. We, we all we want to do is you know tell you if the baby's ugly. That's all we're going to tell you, right? <laughs> you know, um, what you do with it is up to you. But you know, a lot of times we get asked, well, Mark, 
how you know, how would you recommend we handle some of these issues, right? That's a, that's when we would bring in someone like a Stephen or you, or uh, but we would all but we would continue to touch those clients. Um, they bring they so once we do that through then our other process. So we benchmark it. That's then our Cadence Insights process comes in where we develop a roadmap of how do we want to touch the existing customers, how we're going to touch the ones through six, how we're going to touch the sevens and eights, do we, and also just touch the nines and tens, maybe just make sure that they stay nines and tens. But our goal is to get those sevens and eights to nines and tens. And that's that's our goal throughout the year and the following year. So the fact that you got a continuous feedback loop there because markets change, right? Right. And perceptions of markets change. Uh, that That's a fundamental underpinning of how you do continuous improvement throughout the company right. as you improve it. So it's sort of made to order, if you will, for people to come in and actually help them with the implementation. You know? Right. And that's that's the part we were missing from the when we had Pragmetrics before Raj came in. Um, it was the ongoing feedback loop, right? It was a one and done. We would come in, we would do the report, and then we would recommend and we kind of, so, but now we've implemented the pro, our Cadence Insights process that now takes that, continues the process, continues to touch the customer. And again, uh, our goal is to, you know, to get um, the, you know, really the passives uh, into promoters because that's, that's a huge, that's a huge revenue opportunity and uh, you know he, a lot of revenue that's at risk. So uh, that's the piece we've added. That's the piece that the people that we've talked to already, like uh, Ryan at, at Kids Two and Aviva at, at Paysetter Steel, uh, are very interested in. That we're going to actually do that. You know, do it for them or do that with them. Awesome. I heard the analogy this week of you know the silver bullet versus a thousand cuts debt. You know, we're looking for that one fix versus a thousand fixes, continuous improvement versus massive uh, change. And I think that's where our customers are looking for the silver bullet, but they're going to have to pay the price in a thousand cuts to make, to get there. They can't afford, they, they're unwilling as a culture to, to do that massive pivot. And when, when we do strategy, remember strategy is what do we do? And operations is how we do the what. So without the what, you don't, you, you're going to fail in, in the how. So the, the middle ground has got to always be the what, which is the strategy. Now, I like how you've shared that you don't, you're not doing referrals because that you know, avoids a conflict of interest. But still, there's a recommendation thing that I think you're, that can still be leveraged of these are options you could look at. Right. You're recommending them, but you could look at. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Um, I thought a lot about that, our conversation. I'm, be, be, you know, really, you know, willing to explore that. Um, and it, you just, just got to start somewhere. Right? I heard a great, I uh, heard a great analogy um, about, uh, and I was listening to this one uh, um, minister, and he said, um, you know, it's almost kind of like, you know, for you, these or there's you, there are believers that when, when, when Christ selected Peter's boat on the shore. And, you know, to, to dump his nets in the fish, he just said, just push out a little, right? Don't, don't push out a lot, like you said, right? This massive undertaking, just push out a little. Just, you know, so you, you're starting somewhere, right? Just push out a little bit. You know, you're making all these small incremental changes with the goal of eventually, you know, getting to where you want to be, right? So, um, you know, it, it, we got to, we, we start somewhere and, but I think the biggest thing when we get in front of a lot of CEOs, um, the biggest thing is they know they're not getting the truth. They know that they're in a bubble. Um, and, you know, that's why we, we love, we always start at the top. Um, and every time we get together, the executive team's always in there. VPs of sales are very threatened by us because the CEO expects them to know this. But there's no way they can know it. And we know that. But I can't, I can't tell you how many times we've started an engagement and the VPs of sales absolutely love us because I'm a sales guy, right? We, we give them the keys to the kingdom. And then we, they, they quickly, after we start making phone calls and we start giving feedback to them, they quickly become fans of us. And not only that is the loyalty that you build. Um, I can't tell you how many clients that we've talked to, that people said they're just blown away that they would care enough 
to bring a third party in to talk to them. So the loyalty you build just in doing that versus a survey is enormous. Because I've, you know, I've asked people, I, you know, one of the last questions I'll ask is, well, how do you feel, what do you think about this company bringing in a third party versus using a survey? And it's just, it, there's not even, there's not a comparison. Well, Mark, you did a great job. I'm looking forward to uh, getting this uh, up on the YouTube channel and um, promoting it more aggressively. And please um, uh, share with me and anybody else in the uh, ITB family uh, any PR material that you've got that might help um, help us promote your um, your work. Well, guys, we're uh, we're ending right on time, almost uh, right on the nose.